Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on loads on structures. This is from chapter 2, section 2, subsection 4, dealing with snow loads and roof live loads. Uh, snow generally falls uniformly on a horizontal surface. It has a certain thickness that it accumulates to over time during a snowstorm, uh, represented by one of these arrows, and this represents the um, distribution of the snow on a horizontal surface. If an, a, vertic a slope surface intercepts the snow instead, the vertical dimension of the snow is the same, unless, of course, the snow slides off the roof. But assuming the snow sticks and does not slide off, the vertical dimension here remains the same. Um, so this allows us to come up with a uh, symbolic representation and a mathematical representation of what happens on sloped surfaces. Um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, the snow load is 15 pounds per square foot, according to our code. Uh, we also have to design for people up on the roof who might be doing maintenance work, and that we refer to as our roof live load, and the minimum roof live load is 20 pounds a square foot in the North Carolina code. So if we have a roof that anyone can walk on, for purposes of maintenance, we have to design for <clears throat> Of course, if we have a roof which we intend to have occupancy on, we have to design to a much higher load level. And if that roof, by any reasonable interpretation, can be a place of assembly, then the loads that we might have to design for can become quite high. But normally, a roof is designed for 20 pounds a square foot of live load. Snow can be more of a problem than you might think. Um, it doesn't uh, always just sit there. For example, on a roof like this, we might have an accumulation of snow. If the roof is not particularly well uh, um, insulated, we may have a transmission of heat through that surface which might melt the snow under the on the uh, under level um, that melted snow becomes a slick lubricant that facilitates the snow sliding off of that elevated surface um, that snow comes with momentum behind it which accentuates the load on this lower roof but also it just brings more quantity of snow. So we might have to design this lower surface for twice the snow load because of the accumulation of this additional material. And we learned earlier or talked earlier about the whole issue of impact loads. Um, depending upon the height that this snow is falling and whether the snow is icy or powdery, we may have some very substantial additional load factor having to do with impact. Years ago I worked for a firm which designed um, a dome for the Buffalo Bills football team for political reasons it never got built but it came in under budget and would have been a great addition to the city of Buffalo. Um, it was large enough that the Louisiana Superdome would have fit inside it. Um, because of the lake effect in Buffalo, they, they have extreme um, snow conditions there. And in the design of the building, it became apparent that the huge expanses of snow had the potential to kill large numbers of people uh, if an avalanche came off the roof while people were entering into the stadium. So the entryways were actually designed with elements above the openings that were based on the design of icebreaker hull technology. The point being to split the ice up and assure that it didn't come down over the entryways. So there are, there are inertial effects that have to do with snow, which 
um, make it uh, a potential impact load. So we can have fairly long-term loads in some climates where you have months of winter accumulation of snow and that's a classic static long-term load but then you can also have extremely short-term loads associated with these avalanches. The impact loads can become really quite extraordinary. This is a 2,000 foot tall television tower uh, in Auburn, North Carolina. In a previous uh, freak ice storm, there was an accumulation of a substantial amount of ice on the steel elements in this trust column. Then the sun came out and it turned out those accumulations of ice were quite clear so the sun went through and heated the metal underneath so there was no absorption in the ice and no melting of the ice except right adjacent to the surface where it was attached to the steel. Uh, huge pieces of the ice came off in the form of ice missiles, some of which were tipped down stable, and they reached up to 400 miles per hour, and they were so lethal that they smashed through the concrete roof of the uh, building at the base of the tower. And the effect was to destroy all the electronics in that building because it wasn't just the ice that came through but it was the shrapnel from the destroyed concrete roof. When the building got rebuilt this was the design so it's basically a flat roof building um, which again is made out of concrete. In this case though on top of that building or it has concrete components I should say on top of that building are these how trusses, which you'll notice cantilever out to cover parking uh, and protect people going to and from their cars, and then there was parking on the other side. Um, on top of these how trusses is steel grate, which is an inexpensive thing that we buy for industrial purposes in various applications. It's made out of ductile steel, so it's able to deform substantially and in the process absorb large amounts of energy. So in subsequent events, ice missiles have come down. Uh, they bend this material and it has to be replaced. So it's basically sacrificial material, but it manages to completely demolish the ice missiles and absorb the overwhelming majority of the energy. So it breaks up the ice missiles into tiny little pieces which don't begin to have the energy that the original accumulation of ice had. That ends our discussion of snow loads and roof live loads.